I'm going to talk a little bit about wheat diseases and wheat fungicide use. Uh, and I'm also going to include some comments about small grains as well. Uh, I think we're aware that we have a little bit of an unusual year developing at this point in time. It was dry through most of the fall as a result of a lot of the wheat and other small grains that are grown both as for cover crops, forages, and for, uh, for grain didn't get planted. Or if they did, uh, they didn't get planted until the end of November and, uh, and into, uh, into December. So we've got a little unusual situation this year in that the crop, uh, such as it is, is going to be very late, uh, which when you talk about diseases is actually a bit of a positive in that uh, uh, not having the uh, winter cover, game food, and some of the forage plots out there, which are usually planted maybe even as early as late September into early October, uh, can serve as an oculum source for foliar diseases as well as viruses in, uh, in small grains, and they're basically not there. So in all likelihood, we're, uh, we've got less inoculum pressure going into, into this year than maybe we've had in, uh, uh, in, in the recent past. So that's, from that standpoint, that's actually a positive. Um, because some of these other crops do serve uh, uh, a source, particularly for rust disease. Now, of course, uh, depending on what the weather does from now uh, into early April, we'll determine really whether or not we have some serious problems or not. Uh, if the weather stays cold as it was this week, you know, that'll pretty shut pretty well shut down all the diseases that we might be concerned with that could develop over the winter. Uh, if it gets wet out, particularly if it warms up a bit and stays wet, uh, under those circumstances, we're more likely to see more uh, disease activity in wheat and other small grains. So we just have to wait and see what the weather does from now on out uh, as to how much inoculum pressure we're gonna run into. And how do we change? Did you, can you do like a page down? Yeah, I tried that. This happened to us um, yesterday. Eddie and I were having some issues with PowerPoint. Um, uh, oh, wait a minute. Do next. Yeah. Let's try that. There we go. Hopefully we're we're going to have to, we'll have to work our way through it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. As far as rust diseases are concerned, there are three primary rusts in, uh, in wheat. And we see some similar rusts and other small grains as well. Uh, leaf rust, the one at the image at the top, is definitely the most common rust disease that we see on, on wheat. We see very similar diseases on barley and oats as well. Uh, they can get established on wheat in the wintertime, but uh, develop very rapidly in late winter and early spring under the right weather conditions. We almost never see stem rust. It's only shown up a few times in, in years past. Uh, yellow or striped rust does show up some in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, not really, don't really see it anywhere else in the state very often. It is very variety specific. And at least over uh, the last few years in rating plots, it's, it's very variety specific and, and most of our commercial varieties really do not have serious issues with, uh, with yellow rust. So the main one is that we're concerned about is leaf rust and it's fully capable of uh, reducing yields when it's not controlled on a susceptible variety by uh, up to 50%. Uh, in recent years, we've done some work on uh, oats with crown rust and in, uh, on oats, for example, that yield loss can approach 100% given the right circumstances. So it, normally we're really looking for a rust in mid to late March and it develops rapidly from that point on. It, as I said before, wet weather does bring it or accelerate the development of rust. And as far as the state is concerned, and this is true with, mo with foliar diseases in general, is that they're more 
you tend to see more issues with them and they're much more severe the closer you get to the coast. Uh, and then they tend to be less of an issue uh, as you go further north, particularly in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, most of the varieties, are, the varieties do differ in their reaction to rust, although most of the ones we have on the market are not particularly susceptible. And one of the problems in managing diseases of the uh, rust diseases is we're always using resistance as a, as a really effective tool for managing these diseases. But uh, over time, the, the genes, uh, you develop races of the rust fungi that can defeat the genes that are available in many of our varieties. And in other parts of the world, that is happening with, uh, with stem rust. Gloom blotch and, and septoria leaf blotch are two other diseases that we run into a good deal in the state of Alabama on wheat. I don't think they have the potential to reduce yields as much as rust does, but they can look ugly and you can have a lot of damage, particularly from, uh, from gloom blotch damaging the, uh, damage in the seed heads. So you, you tend to see a reduction in seed test weight uh, in those situations. So the gloom blotch is definitely the more damaging of the two the, and is more of a statewide distribution. The septoria leaf blotch, uh, I've only really ever seen it in the Tennessee Valley and it does cause uh, on some varieties noticeable leaf blighting, but as long as it doesn't get into the tops of the plants, uh, it's, it's really not having that much impact on yield and it's Oftentimes in our, in the field trials that have been run in the state of Alabama, it's not always very easy to sow a yield increase from uh, fungicide use for control of uh, these types of blotch diseases. But they're definitely like the rust. Uh, they are rainfall driven. So when we have a lot of uh, wet, mild weather in, uh, in mid March on through the first of, first of May that's really going to push those diseases to develop. Mildew, you know, we're kind of declining in severity. Uh, mildew is oftentimes very showy, uh, but its effects on yield uh, are less than, than perhaps some of these other diseases. It tends to be a problem on when we use too high a seeding rate or in turn rows or where we get a doubling over of nitrogen rates uh, are those areas where you tend to see most of your mildew. It, I mean on some varieties and some circumstances given the right weather patterns it can turn wheat uh, white and it'll colonize, the fungus will colonize virtually every above ground part of a wheat plant. So it's not unusual to see powdery mildew on the seed heads. It tends to be a mild cloudy weather disease, but if it rains a lot, that tends to actually suppress powdery mildew. Uh, so overall, it, it tends to have a lot less impact on yield than, uh, than the other two diseases that I mentioned. And, and a lot of our varieties are, are fairly resistant to, uh, to this disease. One disease that's gotten more attention in the past four or five years has been scab. Uh, it's not only the blighting of the seed head, because it's basically the only part of the plant that, that is affected by scab, but it's also the cause of fungus produces uh, mycotoxins. And we've had issues with this disease, particularly in the last four or five years, and, and the buying points simply are not interested in purchasing scab damaged wheat. They, a few years ago, they bought some and they got stuck with it, couldn't get rid of it. Uh, most of our wheat goes into the baking industry and uh, the mycotoxins tolerance levels are fairly low for food stocks. And there are some other issues uh, that come up with having mycotoxin contaminated grain. So they're, they simply are not gonna buy it. Uh, so it, this is a disease that really does need to be controlled. It specifically develops when we have a lot of rain during uh, flowering. If it's dry during flowering, you won't have issues with scab. But if you get a couple of showers in there, uh, when 
the wheat is in bloom uh, and you get right temperature patterns, it could be off to the races. And this disease is specifically linked with uh, corn production. So it's overall, it's not a good idea to plant wheat after corn, uh, particularly if the corn has been no-tilled. The uh, fusarium fungus that causes scab in wheat also causes uh, fusarium stalk rot and uh, gibberella ear rot in corn. So when you're planting wheat into corn stubble, there's a ready inoculum source and, and the disease is much, much more likely to be a problem there. But uh, we've seen scab outbreaks in, in wheat behind cotton, so it, it's just not only corn is vulnerable for wheat behind corn. And as I mentioned, we do have the uh, mycotoxin issues with vomitoxins, zeralones, and some other uh, fumonisin toxins. And I mentioned here that you would get a significant discount at the elevator, but the reality is they don't want scabby wheat. And the other issue is some growers will grow wheat as uh, animal feed, and those mycotoxins are an issue uh, for some animals, uh, probably beef cattle are the least sensitive, but when you get into animals with simple stomachs, uh, hogs and some uh, birds, uh, scabby wheat's a real problem and, and it's going to cause a lot of issues. So, so its value as a, uh, a feed material or uh, feed additive is, is minimal. If you look at some of the other symptoms of scab, uh, if you look at a seed head that's been infected but not really showing a lot of symptoms, you'll see a distinct peak discoloration around the gloom. Uh, that's the fungus sporulating on the tissue. Uh, if you go a few more weeks where the seed heads have already bleached out, you'll see clusters of small black bodies around the base of the seed and, and the base of the glooms. Those are the sexual fruiting structures of the uh, fusarium fungus. It's a gibberella uh, sexual stage. And of course, that's diagnostic for uh, identifying scab in wheat. If you look at the damaged kernels, they tend to be uh, uh, greatly reduced in size and have a distinct pink, pink cast to them as compared with a normal uh, light or medium tan grain. And in image D, you can just see clearly see the difference between the healthy and the scabby wheat. There is a model out there that growers can use as well as the agents to monitor scab development in their either their crop or their area. Uh, it's a weather-based forecasting model and at least gives the growers and you and I idea as to whether or not scab is likely to develop and then based on the forecast the growers could then decide whether or not they want to come back with a uh, uh, over-the-top fungicide treatment. And these are the websites uh, where this model can be accessed. Of course, right now it's down, but it'll start back up in, uh, in the middle of March. We get into fungicide use, it gets to be an economics and insurance question. Uh, fungicides typically are, are very similar to buying term life insurance. You're getting some protection. Uh, for a short period of time. We're primarily targeting the, these foliar diseases that I talked about. When you get into some of the soil-borne diseases like take-all root rot, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, Economics-wise, we need at least 50 or maybe 60 bushels per acre yield potential in order to even begin to cover the cost of the fungicides and then maybe make some get some additional income benefit from the fungicide or if a grower is producing foundation or certified seed which has a, a higher value than just bin run wheat seed or other small grains uh, then there's a, a, a income potential gain from using a fungicide as well as a quality benefit uh, on top of the on top of any yield gains because you get a much plumper and larger uh, seed as a result, more uniform seed. You know, over the years, as I mentioned earlier, we tend to see more disease issues in southwest Alabama or south Alabama than we do anywhere else in the state uh, as far as wheat is concerned. So in those high disease pressure areas, 
those are the locations when we tend to see a yield benefit and an income benefit out of using fungicides. Uh, and we're particularly addressing the rust disease of septoria powdery mildew. Uh, when you get into scab, it's a little bit different situation because we can have scab outbreaks anywhere in the state. In the past, they used to think and used to have more issues, it seemed like, with it in the Tennessee Valley. But in the last three or four years, we've had severe scab outbreaks down, for example, in Baldwin County. So the disease does have a statewide distribution, and it doesn't matter where it develops. Uh, it's going to cause the same issues with poor grain quality and the mycotoxin contamination. So for scab issues, if, if the risk is high, regardless of where you are in the state, you may need to spray. So we like to see both scalp fields, uh, several locations in field to monitor the foliar disease that we talked about, uh, monitor weather patterns, because the wetter it is, the warmer it is, the more likely you are to have disease issues. Uh, there are a lot of fungicides in the marketplace, so growers need to look at what their disease spectrum is, what, how much cost they want to put into the crop, and make an appropriate fungicide decision. There are generics out there that are relatively inexpensive and will provide adequate control in moderate disease pressure situations, but they're also, particularly in some of the name brand products, are the go-to materials when you're under high disease pressure. And growers, particularly if they scout, have the option of coming with one or two applications. And this is just a listing of all the products that are available for, uh, for use on small grains, just about, or in fact, all of them are labeled for use on wheat. When you get into barley, oats, and triticale, you gotta gotta pick and choose a little bit because some of them are labeled, some of them are not. And when you're dealing with a food and feed crop, you do have to make sure that the product is registered, for, registered specifically for that crop and not just assume because it's a small grain that you can apply it uh, to whatever crop you want to. Very quickly, I'm just going to touch on barley yellow dwarf. I'm sure Kathy's going to talk a little bit more about aphid management, so I'm going to leave all that to her, but it is an aphid transmitted virus disease, uh, green bug being the primary uh, vector, but there's probably more and a lot more, and probably with the conditions we've had this year, it's going to be less of a problem, and it's mainly we could avoid the problem with early planting and some insecticide programs. So basically that's all I had to go over today. And you know, if there's anything that I need to address, let me know, drop me an email and uh, we'll try and get the information out. Thank you. I got a question for you and Brandon may have some later. I run into this with the insecticides, you know, cause it's lots of times people can't afford to be scouting there scouting their wheat because especially with the prices the way they are. If yeah. you can only put a fungicide on once in North, Central, and South Alabama, when would you put that fungicide on? If we're not talking about scab, when the flag leaf is fully emerged. Because we want to, the, the most important thing is that the flag leaf stay intact as long as possible. Okay, so that's, that's, that's going to be key right there yes. in your mind. And then if weather conditions are right and they can use the forecast rather than scouting, Right, with the, with the scab, you've got to... Do that one, but that's yeah. a much later spray. Yeah, with the scab, you're going to have to use the... Uh, I mean, you either base it on weather patterns and cropping history, or you can use the, uh, uh, use the weather-based model as a means of determining whether or not you want to go ahead and, and apply fungicide, because when you deal with scab, you are dealing with name-brand products. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably Procero is is the preferred material at this point in time, Corumba being the other one. And so, uh, and, and those are expensive treatments and really only need to be used in situations where they're more, like, more, more than likely they're going to, you, the grower's going to see a quality and a yield benefit.